<laughs> good morning, everyone, here in the sanctuary. It's so good to see you here and to all of you who have joined us via Facebook Live and Zoom. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us. First of all, happy Memorial Day weekend. I hope everyone's just really feeling that energy of reconnecting as we get to come back together bit by bit. And so, uh, let's see. Oh, yes. Now that we're back in person, you know those little things that can beep and ring and make little sounds? If you could just make sure that those are all silenced right now, we'd really, really appreciate it. And with that, let's join in prayer. Mm, turning our attention inward, right here, right now. Allowing ourselves to feel that part of us that just seeks to experience love, joy, wholeness, abundance, every form of goodness, that every moment of our lives we feel that impulse to feel good in some way. And let's recognize that as the impulse of all life, all creation, because it is the impulse of the one life of God, the infinite goodness, lovingness, wholeness, intelligence, and creativity that God is, out of which everything comes into being, and that lives fully and equally at the center of everything and everyone, including each of us gathered this morning for this virtual Sunday morning service, and well, we call it now the hybrid morning service, in person and online, here at the North Hollywood Church of Religious Science. I absolutely know that God is unfolding and revealing itself perfectly through every part of our service. I know that vibration of God's love is what we feel as we feel our connection as a community I know it is that love of spirit that flows through each and every one of those individuals who are of service this morning. I know it is God that is unfolding through our musicians, Sam and Karen, through our soloist, Susan Edwards Martin, this morning. And I absolutely know that spirit is just radiant and expressing itself beautifully this morning through our beloved Reverend Sidney Lehmanstein. I know that Reverend Sidney is that vessel through which the word that we have come to hear, to awaken to that presence in us and to experience it more fully, is spoken. And we hear it with open hearts and open minds. And so I know so much healing and revealing is occurring in this time together. And for this, I just give so much thanks. I'm so filled with this sense of gratitude as I release this word, knowing it is so in the mind of God, I let it be, saying, and so it is. And together we say, Amen.
<laughs> and so now, please rise and join me in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. And so now let's join in our congregational song, I Am at Home in the Heart of God. <laughs> Thank you, Susan Edwards Martin and Sam and Karen. Ah, yes, please be seated, everyone. <laughs> yes, because now that we've gotten to feel that being at home in the heart of God in that way, let's allow ourselves to just feel that connection in the stillness. So we're going to use these next five minutes to meditate. And so I invite you to take this opportunity right now to just get really still in your bodies. It helps to maybe take a nice deep breath. And as you release that, just relax. Close your eyes, bring your attention inward. And I invite you to silently repeat the mantra, God is the love that I am. God is the love that I am. Just silently repeat that over and over, and I'll bring us out of meditation in five minutes.
Yes. So, we have a treat for you today. Well, there was a treat for Dr. Mark that he got to have a little bit of time off to rejuvenate. You know, we've been going at it pretty steadily since COVID days, if you haven't noticed. But, um, and it so happens that our beloved Reverend Sidney Lehman Steen, whom I think many of you know, she's been supporting us remotely from Oregon, was going to be in town this weekend. So, guess what? <laughs> so, those of you who haven't been attending for eons like some of us here in North Hollywood, uh, you may not know that uh, Reverend Sidney uh, served here at North Hollywood years ago. Um, she became a practitioner. I got to be there the day you stepped into uh, your practitionership. I was like, your teaching assistant. Yeah. Well, don't blame it on me, okay? <laughs> I was in utero at the time. She was in yeah. utero at the time. <laughs> So, um, but we have just become very, very good friends. She was our music director for, uh, what, it was about a year and a half, was it? Yeah. And uh, so we're just delighted that since then, she stepped in to, across the threshold into becoming a minister, and she is with us today to give us a very uplifting and inspiring message, I know. Please welcome back home, Reverend Sidney Lehman Steen. Oh my gosh. Did you write that? I did. And bars of 6 8. I love it. For those of you keeping score at home, that's impressive. Um, this is my home church. Uh, it has been since about 1995, though I've been in other places since then. And I'm really, really, I'm, I'm so thrilled. I'm just, I'm giddy about being here and being able to share with you. Now, there's a fine tradition that Dr. Mark established years ago of often telling a joke or a humorous <laughs> anecdote before he would start. So in honor of that, so a guy is driving around the back roads of a small town, and he sees a sign in front of a house, and it reads, Talking Dog for Sale. He rings the bell, and the owner tells him that the dog is in the backyard. So the guy goes into the backyard, and he sees a Labrador retriever sitting there. You talk? Yup, says the lab. You know, Rump, says the lab. So what's your story, the man asked. The lab looks up, you know, those lab eyes, and says, well, I discovered that I could talk when I was pretty young. I wanted to help the government, so I told the CIA about my gift, and in no time at all, they had me jetting from country to country, sitting in rooms with spies and world leaders, because no one figured a dog would be eavesdropping. I was one of their most valuable spies for about eight years running, but the jetting around really tired me out, and I knew I wasn't getting any younger, so I decided to settle down. I signed up for a job at the airport, and I did undercover security, wandering near like suspicious travelers and characters, listening in. I uncovered some incredible dealings. I was awarded a batch of medals. I got married, had a mess of puppies, and now I'm just retired. The guy is amazed. He goes back in and he asks the owner how much he wants for the dog. $10, the owner says. $10? This dog is amazing. Why on earth are you selling him so cheap? Because he's a liar. He never did any of that stuff. <laughs> Thank you. I'm here all week. How's your steak? Okay. So I'm talking today about this idea of the repeatable Christ. I have to tell you, um, the moment I chose this as a topic, as a title, I thought that is so not a sexy title. It's not very exciting. And yet, it really, really is because we teach here that we are divine and perfect creations sourced by an infinite and loving presence we call God. We teach that we are one with and one of that presence and power. And one of the ways that I love that I saw oneness explained was from Rocco Errico, the, the Aramaic Bible scholar. And, he, and someone asked him, how do you explain oneness? How do you explain this thing that we are all participating in and we are expressions of the divine? And he said, we are chips off the old block. The old block, of course, is God. 
So what is true about God is true about us. What is true about God is true about you and me. So whatever you call this, the presence of God, universal mind, infinite light, great spirit, or Fred, it doesn't care whatever you call it. It is responsive, and it creates according to what we think, what we believe, and what we actively feel. It reflects what is going on inside of us, whether we want it to or not and creates out there according to the patterns of belief and emotions and deep feelings that we hold in here. So imagine a world, just imagine this, in which anything that you focus on, pay attention to, have conviction about, energize, and believe in, responds by mirroring back exactly all of that the results of those things, those thoughts and those beliefs, in manifest form. The moment you think it, if you really, really are passionate about it, it shows up. Now, the thing is, this isn't magical spiritual thinking that we're talking about here. This is actually the law of cause and effect. Jesus taught this, that which you believe, right? As I believe, it is done unto me. Ernest Holmes used to say that if we wanted to know what we're thinking, how our thinking is, and, and what the general tendency of it is, to look at the world around you, look at your personal world, see how it's peopled with your, the quality of your relationships, the quality of your, your, um, your passion, the quality of your finances, your prosperity, the experiences are having. Now, are you happy with what you see? Are you satisfied? Is there room for a little improvement? Is there a room for a lot of improvement? So the teacher Jesus taught the infinite potential of humanity and the influence of the allness of God. And he said, what I have done, you can do. And by the way, you can do a lot better than what I did. So now this idea of doing what Jesus did, that which I have done, you can do, you will do better, you will grow more, you will expand more, you will absolutely celebrate in a greater way. This repeatable Christ came to me as I was reading Eric Butterworth. Now, Eric Butterworth is a legendary author and teacher, more known in the Unity School, but just a, a, a wonderful, mystical, and fun writer. And he believed that this idea of what I have done, you can do, is the missing link in religion. Isn't that wonderful? It's a missing link. Because we have often regarded that possibility of doing, of, of, of living at that level of wholeness, of healing, of responsiveness of, of our word, of declaring our word and saying, you are healed, you are whole, this is good, this too is God. We have thought it as being an unattainable level of holiness or spiritual magic. All that I have done, you can do also all that I have done. This is the repeatable Christ because any great demonstration of spiritual law is repeatable. And you know, we spend a lot of time focusing upon and idolizing the people who seem to demonstrate that instead of actually looking at the process, that act of demonstration itself. So in New Thought, there are a lot of phrases that you hear quite frequently, God is everywhere equally present. God is all there is. We are surrounded and filled by God. And when we say that, what we're really doing is reminding ourselves that whenever anything is done, it can be done. It is a universe of yes. We are living in this responsive, powerful, amazing, yet not amazing spiritual realm in which the only answer it has is yes. It is a world of agreement. It is a universe of agreement. Whatever we get, give it to work with in terms of our beliefs, our expectations, our beliefs about God, our beliefs about our worthiness, the universe says, yes. It's a full law of agreement. It's, you know, the law of electricity is a law of agreement. It only says yes. Whether you plug in a hairdryer or the tines of a fork, it will behave according to its nature, whether you like it or not. The law of gravity will always behave in a congruency of its own nature. Spiritual law is the same way. It's a law of cause and effect. So our practice 
is to know that we are not separate from God. But beyond that practice is that we know hmm, that, that we have immediate, immediate access and full access to that presence, to that activity, that, that use of spiritual law, that that which thou art, I am, and I am that which thou art. So the practice is to know and to practice knowing and to dive into the feeling of what is it to be a chip off the old block? What does that actually look like? What, is that, what does that feel like? Now, it takes work to create a perception of God that is not your enemy. If you have grown up with a God who was some sort of passive aggressive, mean, um, for, heavy artillery, artillery wielding strength, you know, that wanted to just judge and be mean and do all of that. And some of us grew up with that God, that God up here, and some of us did not. Now, in my life, I was thinking about the God that we grew up with. Now, we're in, this, we're in an entertainment area, and I grew up in Southern California and then spent a lot of time here up in the valley, and I did a lot of work as a musician in the studios and did all sorts of stuff. As a young child, I have to say that the role of God in our lives was atmosphere, like background talent. You know, God never was, had a, a leading role. You know, like, it, uh, you know, I, I'm, I love the show Friends. I have seen every episode probably eight times. And in the episode, in, in the show Friends, you have the stars and you have some secondary characters, but then you've got atmosphere and talent in the background. Like, if you know who Gunther is, Gunther around in the coffee shop. In my family, God was like Gunther. Gunther was background, atmosphere, okay? So we, when I came into this teaching, and I was probably 10 or 11, that God began to shift for me. And I even teach in one of my classes how to fire your God and hire a new one. And I literally have my students create a want ad. God wanted, new God wanted, must be responsive, accountable, loving, non-judgmental, fully present, fully active, and, and fully able and available to express in radiant glory. It says something like that, and everybody creates this new God, and they begin to cultivate that. So I came to this because I think we have been in this, um, an evolution of our understanding of God. So when you look at the Old Testament God, um, God 1.0, in the Old Testament, was basically a malignant narcissist, clearly unstable, like someone with a lot of anger issues who had fallen off his meds. <laughs> he was vengeful. You know, he was, he was a vengeful, like a Grinch. You know, picture the Grinch. That was God. You know, and he was ready to just, just like smash you into the ground, only you didn't know when it was going to happen. Okay? But then as time went on, God became, God was rebranded. He became a lot more user-friendly, kind of kinder, gentler. Enter God 2.0. Okay, so now God 2.0, I, and I think that the folks in marketing really had to have like a, a come to Jesus talk with God 1.0 in order to get him to move to God 2.0, which is appropriate because God 2.0 is the New Testament, and that's when Jesus appeared, you know, plot twist, new character. So um, we have God 2.0. <laughs> This is the New Testament God, and he's more patient. And, okay, still a male, but he knew how to listen. <laughs> so instead of just a talker, commander, and a punisher, this was the listening, responsive, all-access God, or mostly all-access God. There were still some intermediaries going on. So think of it this way. God 1.0 was the Grinch. And then God 2.0, in my mind, is like, I don't know, Jimmy Stewart, Walter Cronkite, maybe Tom Hanks, that works, right? So at any rate, Q God 3.0. This is a God not of personality, not of favoritism, and a need to randomly strike people with lightning, but a God that expresses as presence, 
that is here as love, as intelligence, as harmony, as order, as wholeness. God as presence, everywhere present as those qualities. And we live and move and have our being in it. And it lives and moves and has our being in us. And it needs us for that expression. You might have heard the Rumi quote of we are not just single drops in the ocean, but we are the ocean in a single drop. And yet we're all together. Whatever is going on in that ocean of God is what is going on in each of us because we are that. We are the individualized God. So that is the God we're talking about here today. If you have the old versions, by the way, I would suggest that it would be a good time to update your spiritual operating system and get this new, loving, co-creative, and thoroughly beta-tested God. This one really, really works. Um, so all of that aside, you know, we use wisdom texts, the Bible, the Quran, the Torah, all of those things to give us information about who we are, whose we are, and what we are, and how to go forward in that deep awareness. And we pull from those things. That's what Ernest Holmes did. That's what Charles Fillmore, who co-founded Unity, did. Drew from the finest ideas of religion, of spirituality, of psychology, and began to weave them all together in this fabulous tapestry of that which we can use. Now, I am all about applicable spirituality, practicable, practical. Because if it's just something that we're looking at, then we're just talking observable spirituality. And that's a, it's an intellectual exercise. And that's not something I'm interested in doing. So my, my need, my desire, my, my great geek <laughs> is to look at the metaphysical. You know, we can look at the Bible or any of these wisdom texts in several ways. Literal. Historical, metaphysical. Now these two over here, they're for another time. This one here, the metaphysical, is what I deal in. Now we have commonly heard that metaphysical means above the physical, but I've been working with this idea that it means that it is between the levels of the physical. So think about that, that meta physical is that which is flowing, expressing, and celebrating itself between the levels of the seen world, between the levels of the unseen world. That between is the dance that we are doing with spirit. That is the dance that we do. As our own experience of that between, you and I have within us a divine pattern or what we sometimes call a spiritual blueprint for perfection. We call it the Christ center or the Christ light within. So Charles Fillmore wrote this, this Christ or perfect man, woman, idea existing eternally in divine mind is the true spiritual higher self of every individual. Each of us has within him or her the Christ, the Christ, just as Jesus had. And we must look within to realize our sonship, our divine origin and birth. And by continually unifying ourselves with the highest, with the highest of thoughts and words, we too shall become those sons and daughters of God manifest, those creations. Now, this is what I know. There is no becoming involved in this. In fact, this isn't about self-improvement. This is self-unfoldment. You're fine. That center within you is perfect. It has never been damaged. It has never been sick. It has never been hurt. It is that blueprint of you, for you, as you. We go through the world, however, and there are stones and arrows. There are the slings and arrows of human experience. And whereas I do know, and many of us really claim, and, and in our best moments of contemplation and prayer, we can say, I know that I am a spiritual being living in a spiritual world according to spiritual laws. We still are experiencing this manifest physical world. And it's very easy to begin to believe that you are something other than divine. Because the world out there won't do a lot to affirm your divinity. Now, of course, we come into a community like this, and that is, the, that is our sole purpose. 
Our sole, S-O-U-L, purpose is to affirm your divinity, to recognize it, and to know it, by the way, when you don't know it for yourself, which is why we have practitioners. One of the things that my, one of my teachers years ago used to call a practitioner rent a consciousness. <laughs> so those times when you can't lift yourself up or you can't remember and you can't think from that high level of presence and power that God is, that you are as God, we go to a practitioner, and that person knows the truth because that's what they do. And this is a shared experience. It's a community. It's connection. And it's such an important thing. Can you imagine if everywhere you went, everybody, everywhere, knew that they were God and knew that about you and you knew that about them? Now, I'm not saying this would be unicorn, unicorn pink fairy dust world, but what it would be is a world of compassion and kindness. It's a world of awareness. You know, Christ, we call Jesus the Christ, or Jesus a Christ, the anointed one. And here's the thing, Christ means anointed. There were Christs before Jesus walked the planet, and there were Christs after that. Christ means aware, awake, conscious, and that you have had a realization of your connection with the divine, that you are part of something greater, something bigger, and that it is operational within you. And to the degree that we are awake to it, we live from that level. To the degree is really important because it takes a matter of willingness to know that we are divine, that we are loved, that we are loving, that we are that principle in expression. We do resist it, which is fascinating to me. You know, and often I will teach that we have to become willing to be willing to be willing to think about being willing to know that we are divine and so is everybody else. It takes a practice. It is a practice. Ernest Holmes wrote that the Christ is our primordial, primordial template through which all things come into being. Christ is the divine essence. Jesus, Jesus is the name that represents an individualized expression of the Christ idea. So Christ is the divine essence. Mark is the name that represents an individualized expression of the Christ idea. Christ is the divine essence. Sam is the name that represents an individualized expression of the Christ idea. You see where I'm going with this, right? Okay, so whatever your name is, you are the individualized expression of the Christ essence. It can never be damaged. It can never be diluted. It can never be broken. Now, that physical name part of you, that personality part of you, is where we experience the world, and we try to remain connected with that knowing, connected with that flow, connected... Ah, with the light that is always shining inside, but sometimes it gets so covered up that all we can sense is a place of no light. So in thinking about this, by the way, you know, I gave you some visual images about God, 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. I started thinking, and this is where I get completely off the track, so go with me on this. My visual for Jesus is not Brad Pitt. It's more like Jason Momoa. Can I get an Amen. Thank you. Okay. Well, and now I'm back. When you put the name Jesus with the word Christ, then metaphysically you have this representation, this brilliant, bright representation of the human mind and human experience elevated to the awareness of limitless mind and limitless experience. The divine, the divine. We put it together. So the fact that you are here this morning means that you are anointed. You might not feel anointed, or awake and aware, or fully identifying with that radiant light. That's a very dramatic move, isn't it? Um, <laughs> that's new, even for me. Um, but you might not feel that. But here's the thing, something got you here. Some sort of synchronicity. Something brought you into this room. I know that one of my teachers years ago, who has since retired from ministry, when she first found this church, her life was a mess. She had bumped her head, it was bleeding, she had to go to the hospital, it's raining, she didn't even have, she had pajamas on under her raincoat, and she was driving past this church and got a flat tire on a Sunday, 
and had to come in to ask for help, and they ushered her into the back, and there she is, head bleeding with stitches, raincoat, and her pajamas rolled up around her legs. And she sat there and heard Carlo, who was a million years ago, say, everything that happens in your life is created because of what you have thought, what, have you, what you have done, what have you believed about yourself. And she went, oh, crap. <laughs> so Diane became a minister from that. And whatever synchronicity got you here, whether it's a flat tire, whether it's a friend saying, come on, we'll go to brunch, I'll buy, and you're going, well, hey, free, free food, I'm, I'm, I'm in. But you are here, which means that something, ah, something of the divine is calling to that which is divine in you. Something within you is being called divine by the divine. You are anointed here and now. You already are there. And as I said before, this phrase is what I know I need to remember. Just as, just as we live and move and have our being in God, God lives, moves, and has its being in us. We are all expressions of this. We are divine. And that is that repeatable Christ. You know, Jesus lived in the high anointing. He lived in the high consciousness of his identity. And actively aware of that, he lived from it. Now, we call what he did miracles, but I got to tell you, they were ordinaries. Those are ordinaries. When we move into that full, practiced, habitual consciousness, the awareness of knowing that there actually is a light in here and we practice knowing it, our life becomes harmonized. It becomes ordered. We create it because we are creating from a higher idea. It in no way looks like an ordinary life. And yet, ordinary according to God, according to the Christ consciousness, according to the cosmic awareness that there is one presence, one power, it is God, it is good, it is omnipotent, it is the truth about you and me, that is the level that we aspire to, to know and to recognize and to live in our daily life, to repeat the repeatable Christ. You and I are that. You and I are that. We are here to live in this world of yes. And as Ernest Holmes wrote, we are thinking, willing, knowing, conscious centers of life. We are surrounded by, immersed in, and there is a flowing through us, a creative something, call it what you will. The sum total of all our thoughts, our will, our purpose, our beliefs, they, it creates a tendency in this law that causes the law, the spiritual law of cause and effect, of karma, to react to us according, and to create according to the sum total of that belief. Now, Raymond Charles Barker, I love what he, he called the sum total of belief our thought must fear. The thought must fear. So what is your thought must fear? What is it today? Is it, is it clean? Is it pure? Is it flowing? Is it fresh? Or is there some residual, I can't believe this person over here, doesn't believe in science. That's my trigger. <laughs> or this person over here is really, really racist. OK, there's another trigger. This person over here is homophobic, is transphobic, is whatever that thing is. Those are the things that I have to know within my thoughtmosphere are perfect in the mind of God, because we don't just live in a consciousness of denial that we walk into the room and everything's safe, perfect, and again, unicorns and pink fairy dust. We develop this consciousness of knowing that we are whole, that we are complete, so is everybody else. We carry that consciousness out into the world saying, okay, spirit, how would you have me shine a light here? How can I show up here in service and full awareness and in healing? How can I be a solution? How can I rise up to the level of solution? I saw something the other day on Facebook it said the great difference is we move from serve us to service. So as we heal this, any ideas, any gaps, or I like to say, you know, leaks in our basket about who we know, as we begin to mend those holes and come into a full awareness, rise up to that light that we are, that is how we also begin to show up in the world. 
and that's where we make a difference. So yeah, we show up and we are a safe, brave space for people who need us. We are a safe, brave space for courageous conversations that make us feel uncomfortable. Discomfort's fine. You know, discomfort is necessary. And a, a pearl can only be made through the grinding of the sand, right? That's how that comes. And I remember my mom loved this idea years ago, and she would always talk about it, that a hermit crab must shed its shell when it, he becomes too big for it, or she. I don't, are there genders in hermit? Somebody's gonna need to Google that one. Um, when you turn your phones back on. But, so we, <laughs> but that crab must shed the shell that has become too small and then is for a time vulnerable and uncomfortable and threatened even before it finds the shell that it may grow into. So for many of us, we may feel that in this time in our country, in our world, we are in the midst of shedding the old skins, the old shells, and trying to find the new ones that are big enough for this experience. They are going to be created first by our thought must fear. And that's where we will dig into, dive deeply into an awareness and the spiritual practice of knowing that within us is that which is greater than what is appearing in the world. That it, doesn't just define us, by the way, it divines us. So are we going to be defined by the limitations that other people are carrying around with them, or the judgments, or the racism, or their fears? Are we going, are we going to be defined by that, or are we going to be divined by God? Now, I make this choice daily, and sometimes I have to make it on an hourly basis. If I'm at the supermarket and somebody cuts me off and takes that parking space, I have to remember, okay, I am compassionate, I am compassionate, I am compassionate. Jesus, compassion. Com you know, and, and I do this dance with my own between area, that metaphysical. And yet, the intention to remember to do the practice is what will absolutely be what lifts us up. It is the light that will guide us. You know, we're not striving for perfection. That within us is already perfect and, and wonderful. Again, we're not striving for self-improvement. We are striving for self-unfoldment. S, capital S, self. I invite you this week to begin to examine your thoughtmosphere and look for those areas that are showing up repeated that perhaps aren't of the level of the divine that you would like to see expressed. And then also look at those levels which are. And if you can't find those levels, look around this room. You each, we each, are demonstrations and reflections of each other. That's why we're here. This is the perfection of God. This is where we come to remind ourselves, to connect, to have community, community with one, with unity, with service, so that we can show up in the world as the greater idea, the greater love. We are here to do that. Let's do that now. Let's pray. So we turn within, willing, available to recognize that there is one infinite loving power and presence. It surrounds and fills us with itself and indeed is the truth of who and what we are. And we declare now if there have been any areas in which we have held back from being available to that inspiration, to that greater knowing to our repeated, a repeatable Christ, that we now release those areas. We allow the mind within us to just dissolve anything that is unlike love so that we may shine, so that we may love, so that we may be breathing in a thoughtmosphere of that which is the pure, capital T, truth about life. There is one mind, one life, one power, one presence. God, we go there. We are that. And with this collective knowing, I speak my word now for everyone here, knowing that we are indeed lifted up. We lift each other simply by our willingness to be available to a greater idea. We bless each area of our life 
knowing that God is celebrating. God is celebrating as me. God is celebrating as you. God is the celebration here. And we say yes to that. We say yes to this yes, this greater divine yes, knowing that we are here as the yes to live in the greater yes and to be the yes in this planet, in this world, in our neighborhoods, in our families. So we bless this church. We bless temples, ashrams, cathedrals, mosques, all paths to God, knowing that there are so many paths because yes, indeed, there are that many of us here. And we are individualized expressions of that light that is the Christ. How glorious and how wonderful it is. So I am certain that there is a shift now taking place for each of us to a greater knowing of love, to a greater knowing of self, to a greater knowing of possibility, of quantum potentiality, and self-unfoldment. I'm certain that as we go forth, we are a blessing to each other and in the world, and that all of this, all of this is weaving together, is already woven together, as the divine ideal, that ideal that we already are here and now. So it is with a full and grateful heart that I release this word into spiritual law, knowing it is so. And so it is, and I invite you to say with me, amen. Thank you very much. I am so blessed. I am so blessed. And so let us put our gifts to our hearts. For those of you in the sanctuary, we will collect them at the back of the sanctuary as you exit. And let's say our statement of giving together. From the love of pure spirit within me, I bless this gift. I send it forth to heal and bless and prosper. It is evidence of my faith and belief. It does good work in the world and returns to me multiplied abundantly. like to get more of that inspiration, you can get Susan's music at unlimitedsusanedwardsmartin.com. And yes, oh, okay. Oh, so if you didn't hear that out there, just ask Alexa to play Susan Edwards Martin music and, well, you'll be in a whole other place of... <laughs> that repeatable Christ. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Oh my God, was that fun. <laughs> I got to be part of her pathway. <laughs> so, okay. Donations uh, over the phone, for those of you who are watching remotely, uh, there are several ways you can make donations. Over the phone, we'll be here for about 30 minutes after service uh, to take your call if you'd like to do that donation by credit or debit card. Uh, those of you who are online, you can go to nhcrs.org forward slash give. And from there, you can make a one-time one or a recurring gift. Uh, or you can text the word 
give, yes, to area code 818-457-3419. So you can even do it from a silent cell phone here in the sanctuary. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, Prayer with a Practitioner will be available following the service on Zoom. So if you're on Facebook Live, just go to our website and then connect to the Zoom patio and we will connect you up with a practitioner. Anyone here wanting prayer after service, we will have a form that you can sign up and we will uh, just tell us when it's a good time for you to be contacted and we'll have a practitioner call and pray with you. You can email prayer requests to prayer at nhcrs.org or call into the church office and option four allows you to leave a message with your prayer request. Uh, so Wednesday evening service, as usual, service uh, meditation beforehand starts at 6.50, service itself at 7, and that's only on Facebook Live and Zoom at this point. And my topic this week is your true power. I think I'll be tapping a lot into what you said. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> So save the date, folks, for this very exciting movie night coming up, which uh, you don't just have to save the date. You can actually start purchasing tickets. So that will be on Friday, June 18th, 7 p.m., and we'll be screening the movie Sound of Metal uh, for limited in-person viewing. And also, uh, you'll be able to view it online uh, just, the, I believe it'll be like the day before, we'll be sending you uh, an email with the link to be able to watch it online with us. So this event will be hosted by Paul Racy, who was actually nominated for Best Supporting Actor for the film. Yeah. And his beloved wife, Liz Racy, who is one of our practitioners and who uh, has been caring for our teens for years. And uh, so there'll be a Q&A afterwards. Uh, and the tickets are $10 and are available on the website, nhcrs.org. And we look forward to seeing you either on Zoom or uh, here in person. As those of you know, here at the sanctuary, we are opening up uh, for in-person attendance on Sundays. So we still will just be doing the 945 service uh, for now. Uh, and, of course, we will continue to live stream on Facebook Live and Zoom. We don't expect that's going away anytime soon. We've got so many people who join us from different parts of the country. We love it. So uh, my Wednesday evening service right now is still by uh, Zoom and Facebook Live, but we do uh, plan to open it up on June 9th, on Wednesday, June 9th. So, yes. <laughs> Thank you. And of course, we'll be live streaming that as well. Zoom virtual patio before and after our Sunday and Wednesday services. You can connect with your fellow congregants. So uh, please take advantage of that to stay connected if you aren't able to come back yet. The men's group is meeting uh, still right now via Zoom every Sunday, 11 to 11.30. Our Zoom meditation in the morning is from 8 to 8.15 a.m. And for all information about all these things I've talked about and so much more, uh, visit our website, nhcrs.org, and uh, you can get that information. About the, uh, I was just reminded, in-person attendance, please note that we will be closing the gate that is closest to the sanctuary, that uh, you should enter from the back gate, because as you know, we've got these doors open, and uh, it's quite distracting when people are driving by right outside the sanctuary. So, and it really happen, uh, helps with the traffic flow. So uh, just be aware of that. Um, being at the closed gate and honking doesn't really help when we're in meditation. <laughs> Although it gives us tools to practice with, I'll admit. <laughs> with that, one more time, thank you so much to our beloved Reverend Cindy Layman Stevens. So good to have you here in person. Let's stand and let's sing the peace song.
So please repeat after me. I am at home in the heart of God. I am at home in the heart of God. My life is anchored in truth. My life is anchored in truth. I can never be separate. I can never be separate. I live in the consciousness of peace. I live in the consciousness of peace. I release all fear. I release all fear. I am living love. I am living love. Thank you. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Oh, thank you.